Hi, good afternoon. I'm Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt, and I'm very excited about our talk today and very pleased to invite each and every one of you to join us um, as we're going to be speaking with Ambassador Denny Dayan. This is the fifth in our series of conversations that have taken place over the last couple of months, um, with the exception of our conversation with Ambassador Dermer, all of which are available online um, uh, on our website, which is ZionistRabbis.org. Uh, there you can find the conversations we've had and you can feel free to share and distribute them. I want to take a moment just to tell you about the two upcoming calls that we have. And that is that on July 28th at 4 p.m., Rabbi Abraham Cooper of the Simon Wiesenthal Center will be speaking to us about what do you say to an anti-Semite? Some of you may know he's the one who spoke with Nick Cannon and got him to uh, retract some of his statements. And we thought it'd be fascinating to hear from him what kind of a message you carry to him and discussing the uh, whole aspect of uh, uh, what happened there. And then on Wednesday, August uh, 5th, so there you see the conversation there. On Wednesday, August 5th at 1130 a.m., we're going to be having a conversation, and that will just be for rabbis as well as for, um, uh, in fact, rabbis who are members of the Zionist Rabbinic Coalition. And so that, that will be a session which we'll be having on uh, the 5th. Um, an open discussion and conversation about our uh, about our uh, work and also in terms of what kinds of things uh, uh, we learn from these conversations. So with that, let me take us now to uh, uh, introduce uh, our special guest today, Ambassador Danny Dayan. Uh, he is the Consul General uh, of Israel in New York. And with that, he carries the title of being ambassador, representing the state of Israel throughout New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Iowa, uh, actually Ohio, Delaware, and elsewhere. Um, and this position, he was nominated by, uh, by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, and uh, one of the things that's so fascinating about Danny is he really goes across so many different lines and uh, is able to build coalitions. We'll be talking with him about that. In fact, it may be interested to know, some of you know this, some of you may not, that he was chairman of the Council of Jewish Communities in Judea and Samaria uh, from July of 2007 until January of 2013. We'll want to hear a little bit about what he did there. Um, and uh, prior to that, um, he began his professional career as a businessman. And at the age of 26, he founded El Ad Systems, which specializes in sophisticated information systems, outsourcing, faci facility management, company that he sold um, in 2005 at a time when it employed 500 IT professionals. So he comes to us with a very interesting background, and um, he is returning to Israel in um, about a week and a half. And so we're very, very fortunate and very pleased that you are taking time. Uh, we know what it's like to move and here you are with us. So, so Daraba, thank you, Danny. And thank finally, you, just to say that over the years, I've gotten to know Danny and consider him a friend and uh, really very much appreciate all you've done on behalf of the American Jewish community as well as personally. Thank you so much, everyone. But you know, uh, I'm very happy to be here because uh, for many reasons, but probably uh, one of the most important is, uh, as you said, I try to maintain a dialogue with all uh, uh, Jewish organizations, and not only organizations, all the sectors of the Jewish community. I'm proud that I reached out even to, to Satmar on one hand, uh, with some uh, uh, success, uh, 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 limited obviously, and uh, uh, to, 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 to J Street. Everyone was an, a, a, an interlocutor for me as long as uh, uh, every Jew, as long as uh, he or she are uh, committed to the existence of the State of Israel. Um, and, uh, but I, so I, 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 I had conversations with right and, we, and left, but the organizations and the groups that I like most are those that are neither uh, right or left, are those that, they, that have the word Zionist in their name. And uh, you are one of them, and in days in which the Z word is one of the most distorted and vilified uh, and words in, in, in our jargon, I think the fact that uh, organizations proudly uh, have that word in their name uh, is extremely significant, and thank you for doing it. Thank you, and thank you for what you do. So let me jump right in. I want to talk uh, at the beginning just a little bit about your background. So you were born in Argentina, and you came to Israel when you were uh, about 16 years old. Tell 
tell us a little bit about that. Was that your family's decision? Uh, How did you feel? Was it hard to adjust? Did you feel Israeli right away? Just tell us a little bit about those early years and when yeah, you began I, to feel I, like you were I, really It was Israeli. obviously a family decision. I came with my parents. It was a very courageous decision for my parents that were already, my dad was already 50, uh, that at that time I thought is a very advanced age. <laughs> and uh, we were, I was raised in a staunchly Zionist uh, family. Uh, my parents uh, were uh, disciples and followed of Zev Jabotinsky that today, exactly today, is 80 years from his uh, death in, in Hunter, New York. Uh, today it was the, 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 the old side as Kara. Uh, and later of uh, Menachem Begin. Uh, so I would say it was a staunchly Jewish, uh, profoundly Jewish, staunchly Zionist, but quite non-observant uh, family. And uh, as many Argentinian Jews. Right. And you know, I am in a great, to a great extent, I'm, I don't know if I am a good product or a faulty product, but I am a product of two things. I am a product of my family. I am a product of the incomparable education, Jewish educational system that existed in Argentina those days. Um, uh, I am fortunately, I think that uh, doesn't exist uh, anymore at that level. I spoke fluent Hebrew when I came to Israel uh, and uh, that made my uh, absorption, as we call it, my klita, uh, much easier. Um, uh, and you know, that brings me also to say that uh, what I see as the gravest danger, a gravest problem uh, the American Jewish community has is the crisis of Jewish education. Uh, one generation without proper Jewish education is a problem. Two generations without uh, a Jew proper Jewish education is a huge problem. Three generations without a proper Jewish education is a catastrophe. Absolutely. So uh, just a little bit more about uh, prior to your role here, and that is you were in both business vis-a-vis uh, -vis high tech and then politics. Um, but is it all politics now? In other words, do you see yourself going back into business? Uh, which do you like better? Uh, what's the difference, etc.? Well, you know, yes. So when uh, uh, I left the army and uh, I studied computer science and economics, I went into the IT information technology business uh, quite a young age before it became fashionable in Israel, um, and uh, I was quite successful. But uh, I must admit that uh, even when my daily occupation was uh, to read the uh, balance sheets and uh, 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 financial reports, uh, my heart was in the headline of the newspapers, what is happening uh, politically speaking in Israel. I even had a, a brief... Uh, incursion into partisan politics uh, during that period with a party that doesn't exist anymore as most Israeli parties. It was called the Tria, a party yeah. led by Professor Yuval Neeman, a world-renowned physicist, and Geula Cohen and others. It was a party that uh, combined neither a, a religious nor a secular party, a, a party that combined the uh, the entire Israeli society. Also, when I moved from Tel Aviv with my wife to Samaria, to Maale Shomron, we choose a, a community that is neither religious nor secular, but encompasses the entire uh, uh, mosaic that is the Israeli society. The so Israeli so society. Tell, tell us a little bit about your work with the uh, Yesha, the, the uh, uh, Judea and Samaria Council, because I think many American Jews, many rabbis might not really understand what that's all about. Um, nor, in, if, for that matter, in terms of uh, settlements and so on. So share with us a little bit. Are you going back? You know, I was uh, a, a not and I married uh, uh, in 1987. And uh, uh, shortly after the second, the first Intifada began. And um, we very, had very comfortable lives in Tel Aviv. Uh, my wife was a senior executive in one of the most trendy advertising agencies in Tel Aviv. Uh, I was uh, the CEO of an IT firm and uh, we enjoyed the cultural scene of Tel Aviv. We enjoyed the gastronomic scene of Tel Aviv probably too much uh, and uh, uh, that left its marks on me. 
and uh, uh, all what the big city has to offer. I was also born in a big city in Buenos Aires. But uh, when we looked at the TV screen and saw our uh, brothers and sisters in Samaria and Judea being attacked, the first intifada was basically in, in Judea and Samaria, almost uh, uh, not in the, inside the so-called Green Line. We thought that uh, is our duty to be there. And uh, we moved to Male Shomron, a, a small but a beautiful community in central Samaria. Um, and uh, I didn't look back. We, regret, we didn't regret it for a minute. Uh, later, when I sold my, my firm, um, and it was after the disengagement, the, the withdrawal from, from Gaza Strip in 2005, and the, the leadership of the, the settlements, the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria was virtually shattered. Um, I was part of a group that uh, thought that it is a, 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 a problem uh, and uh, we reconstructed the Yesha Council, which is the umbrella organization of the movement. And quite surprisingly, I was uh, asked virtually by everyone to take the helm to be the, the chairman. I intended to do it for a year or two until we re uh, start the, the operation, the, the advocacy, and but uh, it was so intense and so uh, interesting and so uh, important that I stayed there for six years. So, so when you first came here, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was some apprehension, apprehension among a number of American Jewish leaders. Who was this crazy right wing guy who's coming to be the consul general? Am I right? And how you know how'd you feel about that? Not how'd only you deal that. With uh, not only that. Uh, I uh, in August 2015, I, I received a phone call from Prime Minister Ben Netanyahu, and a uh, surprising one. I didn't expect that. Uh, and uh, uh, the Prime Minister with him, I had a relationship, obviously, uh, asked me to go as ambassador to Brasilia. And uh, I didn't want, uh, I wasn't interested in, in going to Brazil, um, but he was very persuasive and very insistent and uh, ultimately I accepted the nomination as ambassador to Brasilia. He explained why it's strategic for Israel at that point in of time. And uh, what happened in a quite a, 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 a almost unique case because of my background as chairman of the Yesha Council, the then president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff, which was quite uh, um, hostile to Israel, uh, didn't uh, um, accept my nomination. And then I landed in New York. I think You heard me because your screen was- Yes, open. yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, 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 then uh, the prime minister asked me where would they like to serve? And my answer was instantaneous at New York because uh, uh, I think there is no greater privilege and no greater, no more important mission than to represent uh, the state of Israel to the largest Jewish community outside of Israel. I see that I saw that then. I see it now as the most uh, one of the most important missions that an Israeli diplomat can have. I want to come back to that in a moment, but let me just ask you this: because obviously, as somebody who lives in uh, the Judea and Samaria, um, the whole issue of annexation is maybe have a more personal impact on you. Um, one of the questions that one of the rabbis had said to me from one of our earlier talks is, "What benefit is there to Israel of annexation?" Why, why even do it, you know, when it, it, so many people uh, don't understand? And of course, the, there are those who say the term should be extension of sovereignty. So yeah, can you okay. help us let's, understand? Let's put semantics aside uh, for the sake of brevity. By the way, uh, uh, just as a follow-up to your previous answer, yes, I know persons, one of the leaders told me that uh, very candidly that uh, Rabbi Rick Jacobs called the prime minister office and say, please uh, don't send this flamethrower uh, to New York. And uh, obviously when he told me that uh, a year later, he, he said I was completely wrong. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you are a bridge builder and not uh, a flamethrower. 
Um, now to your question, uh, uh, look, I, I understand why sometimes, why it is difficult for American Jews to understand the issue of uh, so-called annexation. Look, I would say that if we are different, uh, if I uh, think what is the most central value of Israeli Jews, the most central Jewish value of Israeli Jews, I think that the most central value, Jewish value for Israeli Jews is Shivat Zion, the return to Zion. What is the most central value for most American Jews? I think it is Tikkun Olam. And the reasons we are different is because we grew up uh, in different circumstances. We have to uh, build for the first time in 2000 years an exclusively Jewish state, or not exclusively, but a Jewish majority state. Um, American Jews had to blend into an existing society. Those are two different uh, strategies of developing your characteristics. So the question for us, for Israel, is not why should we do it? The question is, would there is any reason not to do it? And when I analyze the situation, I think I really don't see why not, because people say it's an obstacle for the two-state solution. Well, the two-state solution didn't happen 52 years, actually 72 or even 100 years, uh, and not because of us. We accepted every single time that the two-state solution or partition plan was offered, we accepted it. Uh, from 1936 to 2014. Um, and more than that, it's not, a, not an obstacle for a two-state solution also because, let me remind you, that Israel did and very probably will negotiate annexed territory. Israel annexed is Jerusalem. Nevertheless, Israel, I may like it or not, but Israel negotiated East Jerusalem. Israel annexed the Golan Heights. Nevertheless, Israel negotiated the Golan Heights. Israel is sovereign the Chalutza dunes in southern Israel um, since 1948. Nevertheless, Israel negotiated the Chalutza dunes in the, in the Egyptian border. So it isn't really an obstacle to anything politically. What does it do? It does two things. One, it sends a very clear message. What are the positions of Israel in a negotiation? That doesn't mean those, this will be the final status. It means those are Israel positions, and we make it very clear the Palestinians will come, when they will come to the negotiation, negotiating table, they will present their positions that we will negotiate. The second thing that it does, you know, Rabbi, my wife, Einad, that I already mentioned, works in the Ariel University. In, the, in Samaria. You know who promulgated as a university, the Ariel University? A general in the IDF. Not the Ministry of Education of Israel, but a general in the IDF. That is an anomaly that stems from the fact that Israel didn't apply sovereignty over Ariel. So those kinds of anomalies will cease. That doesn't, as I said, preclude anything. For sure, doesn't make Israel as some, excuse me, some uh, inexplicably unex say an apartheid state. Um, let me remind you that uh, in 1967, Levi Eshkol, Golda Meir, and Moshe Dayan annexed the eastern areas of Jerusalem including Arab population. In this plan, there is no annexation of Arab populated areas. And uh, I don't think that Israel uh, became, for the, that reason, a, a, an apartheid state. Actually, I think the vast majority of American Jewry applauded that decision then and still applauds it, uh, applauds it today. Uh, so I really uh, think that uh, uh, the question is why not and not why should we do it. I don't see a real downside to that decision. That, that, mean, that doesn't mean that it will happen. As you know, uh, 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 it didn't happen in July 1st. And right now, I don't see it happening uh, in the coming weeks. But the possibility exists. And if it happens, and I'm still here as, as an Israeli diplomat, I, it will be very easy for me to defend that, uh, the result, that decision with great conviction. and holding the moral high ground.
So have you had conversations with uh, progressives, with people who are uh, opposed to this? And, and have you been able to make any headway in, in any of those conversations? Well, uh, first of all, I did have those conversations with progressives. Uh, I received uh, a, a, a request by uh, an alliance of Jewish progressive groups uh, in New York to meet with me uh, on this issue. I understand that some of my colleagues uh, refused. I accepted immediately. We did it via Zoom because of the circumstances. And we talk about it uh, with candor and with dignity and with uh, mutual respect. Uh, can, I say that, can I say that I convinced them? I don't know, you know, it's very hard to convince uh, uh, people on uh, long-held uh, convictions, but uh, I think it's important uh, to talk about it, to speak about it. I, I raised that question also in the farewell, uh, the, 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 the issue was raised in my farewell uh, uh, conversation with Rabbi Jacobs, Zara Burdal in the URJ and other places. I'm never shy to, to, to present my positions I didn't come to New York, you know, uh, to, to preach to the choir. I came to New York to talk, does, to, talk to those that uh, uh, are skeptic uh, of the policies of the government I represent, that love Israel, but are skeptic of the policies. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I, you know, the first thing I told my staff when I came to New York four years ago is uh, I could start my a uh, day with, uh, let's say, Young Israel Congregation and uh, continue in Evangelical Temple and end the day in a Tea Party rally and get three standing ovations and at the end of the day I did nothing. I want to meet those that uh, need, uh, I, I, I can and, and want to, to sway them closer to Israel. Can you share with us any particularly challenging or uncomfortable moments or encounters or individuals or groups that you uh, 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 were dealing with during uh, your tenure here then, based on what you just shared? Well, you know, I think that uh, I must admit that for me, the most difficult uh, uh, topic to uh, deal with, because I will be sincere, I'm finishing my term in 10 days, I can be very candid. I was not convinced that my government's position is right, uh, is the issue of religious pluralism in Israel or the lack of religious pluralism in Israel. And uh, in that respect, I must admit that I even had some arguments with uh, the highest levels, uh, the highest echelons in Israel uh, that you can imagine. Uh, and, um, you know, when I came here to New York to, and the area in which I represent Israel, I said that uh, in respect to the governors I work with, the, the members of Congress, the senators, etc., I am a one directional ambassador. But in respect to the Jewish community, I am a bi directional ambassador. I intend to be a uh, an envoy of Israel to the American Jewish community, but also an envoy of the American Jewish community to the government of Israel and to Israeli public opinion. And I think I did it that way. And I will tell you a story. During one of those events in which I had my differences of opinion with the, my government, uh, one very senior Israeli, very senior, told me a story. He told me, you know, Danny, uh, when the legendary Secretary of State George Schultz would call, would host an American ambassador in his office in Foggy Bottom in the State Department, he will take him to a map of the world and tell him, Ambassador, show me where your country is on the map. So the ambassador to Brussels would point Belgium and the ambassador to Brasilia would point uh, Brazil. And then Schultz used to tell, you are dead wrong, Ambassador. Never forget your country is the United States of America. And uh, the subtext was probably, I forget, I got to present Israel uh, to the American Jews and not vice versa. And my answer was, and it still is, that uh, that's correct about uh, foreign countries. Uh, the American Jewish community is not a foreign force, it's not a foreign power is part of us and I have no um, inhibition and no uh, a reservation on uh, representing uh, uh, 
uh, as I said, being an bi bidirectional anthem. So any hope of any pro progress in regard to um, uh, either the issues of pluralism and or of the Haredim uh, either lessening their hold on certain issues and or maybe even coming to accept other alternatives and uh, so on, things like that. Uh, um, I can't say that we have made huge progress, uh, but there are some encouraging signs. Uh, for instance, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, an Israeli publication, Makor Rishon, which is uh, um, basically a, a modern orthodox, uh, conservative, uh, conservative not in the religious uh, uh, sense, um, a publication had a, a conference, a virtual conference on Israel and diaspora relations, and, and a very, uh, uh, I would say, quasi Haredi uh, rabbi, Eliezer Melamed from Arbracha in, in, in Samaria, uh, uh, really uh, gave an, 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 a conversation with a female reform rabbi, and he said very surprising, uh, encouraging things about the uh, our duty to, to accept uh, all Jews uh, and, and reform and conservative Jews, especially as, 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 as our brothers, even when there are theological discrepancies that cannot be bridged. And uh, it is very encouraging that he ignited the discussion on this yeah. issue among, uh, among uh, uh, orthodox and ultra-orthodox uh, 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 sectors of the society that uh, I don't remember as such uh, in the past. Interesting. I, for sure, when I come back to Israel, intend to contribute to that. Interesting. Thank you. We, we look forward to, to continuing that dialogue and so on. Interestingly, uh, by the way, Buzi uh, Herzog had mentioned also that same uh, uh, a reference in our conversation with him, uh, a recent conversation with him. So I want to ask a couple of questions rapid fire, and that is, um, what is it that American Jews, American rabbis, uh, don't know or understand about Israel and Israelis um, in general, and then maybe even some specific aspects of that? You know, I would say, they would put it this way, Rabbi. Um, American Jews, for sure, American rabbis know the issues we deal with very well. You know everything about uh, the, the conflict with the Palestinians, and you know everything about uh, 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 Iran, and you know any everything about uh, uh, Mizrahim and uh, Ashkenazim and Sephardim in Israel and the rabbinate and this and that. You know the issues very well. You don't always understand the way we form our positions on those issues. You don't always understand our, how we rationalize and how we process positions and we, we get to our conclusions. And uh, if I can be a little bit, uh, you will have a little bit of chutzpah, I will say this. American Jews, American synagogues, American communities, American feder Jewish federations, um, probably should, instead of inviting as keynote speaker five times Tsipi Livni, and sometimes balancing her with uh, Michael Oren, two persons I admire, I am very friendly relationships with them, but that's a somewhat distorted picture of the Israeli society, of the Israeli political discourse. Uh, I would suggest that instead of having five times Tsipi and Michael, have once Arya Deri, have once uh, a settler leader, have once uh, a ultra-orthodox Haredi politician, um, a Mizrahi politician, a, a development town a politician, leader, a mayor. Uh, sometimes, uh, even if you need, in order to do that, a uh, translator from English to from Hebrew to English. But you will Ultra get the, involved in the echo chambers where we hear. You just will the get a much accurate understanding of the way the Israeli society and therefore also the Israeli political system forms its positions. There are also issues, you know, that uh, uh, 
it, they are difficult to understand for afar, even if we are Jewish. Uh, I sometimes compare it to your second amendment. Uh, uh, Israelis uh, don't, I'm not sure we understand the second amendment, many of us. But uh, why it is a sacred uh, right to be around us. But when you come here and you learn the issue, uh, you understand at least why it does exist, how historically, uh, what legacies, uh, what ways of thinking uh, uh, created that creature, that, that amendment. The same thing happens probably uh, in issues like uh, uh, um, the lack of religious pluralism in Israel. When you understand how Israel, is, how Israel came to be a society, from which countries Israel, the immigration to Israel was was uh, 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 prevalent, uh, how we formed our, our, our uh, uh, um, character, then you understand, you don't have to, you, you, that doesn't mean you, you are convinced, but you understand things that sometimes I feel that American Jews do not understand. So the perspective, the, the prism sometimes is difficult and different. Uh, whether it is security, whether it's history, um, a culture also. Do you, did you find differences um, in terms of the uh, cultural uh, uh, and societal, such as Israel being a, a more com communitarian, uh, Israel, uh, America a little more individual? How, did you see that in, in your uh, service here? And did that play out at all? Yeah, I think that uh, yeah, Jewish culture in America and in Israel are somewhat different, but I don't think that's the main uh, difference. Also, you know, I want to be very careful in my, uh, how I, I word my, my sentence because those are always uh, sensitive issues. Uh, don't forget that also Israelis, Israeli Jews and American Jews are uh, sociologically different also from the, uh, our, I would say, ethnic composition. Uh, Israel is 50% uh, a Sephardic and Mizrahi uh, uh, society, which brought different contributions to the Israeli uh, 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 society, while American Jewry is, I think, between 20, between 90 and 95 percent Ashkenazi, uh, with different, uh, so the, the only virtually uh, the, the contributions, the mix that created uh, this thing that is called the uh, the, the American Jewish community are different from the contributions, the cultural contributions and religious contributions and, 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 and legacies that uh, created the, the Jewish, uh, Jewish, the Israeli Jewish community. So um, within this context of the points of difference between the American Jewish community and Israel, um, uh, rattling off a couple of issues, and then by the way, I received a, a question about the uh, uh, extension of territory and uh, sovereignty and annexation. I want to come back to that in a minute, but before that, um, uh, such as with uh, Iran and how important an issue that was for Israel, um, as well as, for example, the uh, recognition of Jerusalem as its capital and moving the embassy there, um, which received a tepid response in some aspects of the American Jewish community, somewhat surprisingly. Iran, where we, whereas it was a consensus issue in Israel, was not necessarily a consensus issue here. Um, has the American Jewish community let Israel down on, on some occasions, would you say? Well, uh... You know, uh, in some sense, yes, but uh, look, uh, I, my belief is that uh, it's very important that we uh, make a clear distinction between rights and positions. Uh, rights are rights are rights. They are inalienable, and that's the reason I think, for instance, the, rise of, the right of, uh, to, to pray and to in the Kotel uh, uh, for any Jewish denomination is a right, is a right, is a right, and is inalienable, it should be respected. Positions is a different thing. Positions are an issue of debate. And I think we have an obligation to listen attentively to the position of the American Jewry uh, uh, on any issue that relates to Israel, because that's the meaning of, uh, of, of, of mutual respect and, and, and mutual a responsibility, but uh, ultimately the decisions should be made by Israelis only because we Israelis are those that will bear the consequences directly. Um, you know, Rabbi, I think in some senses that what uh, puzzles me and 
bothers me, uh, and I would say even annoys me sometimes, is the, that considerations uh, of American Jews relating to Israel are sometimes uh, influenced too much by partisan politics. Um, I will give you one example. There is a certain Jewish organization, a certain Jewish progressive organization that uh, in December 2016 um, pleasantly surprised me when they called on President Obama in his last days of his administration, they called him to veto the infamous UN Security Council resolution against the settlement 2243. Uh, I was surprised that they called on President Obama to veto an anti-settlement uh, resolution. Uh, a year later, that same organization called on President Trump not to move the embassy to Jerusalem. And I can't understand the paradox. I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if the opposite would have happened they would call on President Obama to, uh, not to veto, they called him to veto, sorry, I, I, they called him to veto the, the, the anti-Israeli resolution. I wouldn't be surprised if the opposite had happened. They would call Obama to punish Israel on, on, on settlements, but applaud President Trump moving the embassy to Jerusalem. So how can you explain that paradox? Only in, American domestic political terms, only in domestic political terms. And that, that bothers me. I think that uh, when American political considerations, uh, domestic considerations override on Israeli issues, the interest, the Jewish interest, the, Jew the position of Jewish organizations, I think is bad. I will tell you more than that. I sometimes notice, and I, again, I'm very undiplomatic here, I, in, 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 in quite a few occasions, I noticed the uh, extremely pro-Israeli American Jews, uh, Democrat American Jews, what they hate most is a pro-Israeli Republican, and, and Republican American Jews, what they hate most is a pro-Israeli Democrat, because that, uh, 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 that makes it harder for them for making the point that their party is the pro-Israel party. And you know, those things uh, uh, puzzle me, at least I would say. So, so part of what I, your message to American jury, I guess, is to let our uh, support and love for Israel transcend our individual partisan political affiliations. Definitely. Okay, yeah. so coming back to the um, question about the extension of sovereignty, as I said, uh, one of my colleagues sent me uh, uh, a question where he felt that, that he didn't quite understand enough from your uh, response, wasn't quite uh, convinced by it. And that is looking at what Israel may possibly lose if it does go ahead with that, in terms of relations with Arab nations, with the EU, uh, uh, Jordan's response to it, and so, uh, as well as here in America, apropos of what we just discussed, within the progressive community, so that there seems to be that there may, to this uh, rabbi at least, that there may, who asked, there may be a, a, a more serious downside. Um, uh, Mitchell Bard wrote an excellent piece that was basically said, uh, uh, we Americans just don't need to tell Israeli really something they don't already know, but nevertheless, how do you respond to those uh, uh, aspects of it? Yeah, sure, but you understand yeah, uh, that the, the, all those arguments which are valid and merit uh, 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 consideration, are not part of the intrinsic value of the inherent value of the annexation move, but of the consequences uh, uh, in the international arena, how others will see, will, will act. Uh, 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 but I, I answered the, my question on the why Israel uh, is considering do it, doing it. What are the, the intrinsic values of the, 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 the a decision. I, we, we for sure take into consideration the position of the administration here, the American jury, the EU, and uh, 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 Jordan, and other other players, of course. But that is not part of the, as I said, the the, the, in, the intrinsic value of the of the uh, decision. 
nevertheless, in, in, in politics, in international relations, of course, those are things that are being, that should be taken and are being taken into con consideration. Got it. And so um, following up on that, then, in terms of the, uh, uh, what pressures did you have of the American Jewish community when you came here? What has changed about your uh, previous uh, assumptions? You know, I, I, I came here, uh, uh, I can't say that I was uh, hugely surprised. Uh, I, I never lived in the United States. I have never been in the United States for more than, I don't know, seven or 10 consecutive days, but I have been here uh, multiple times, 20, 30, 40 times. Uh, so I have quite uh, uh, an idea of what I can do. You know, people ask me what surprised you here, and uh, it's a very small thing, but for me it's very significant. Um, I must admit that in my civil life, in my previous life, in my normal life, I am not a big uh, shul goer. So in the 30 or 40 times that I was in New York, probably I'm not sure I visited the shul, and if I did, uh, I think it was Temple Emmanuel to see the architecture and not the service. Um, when I started here to visit the innumerable shuls uh, from all denominations, um, I was very pleasantly surprised to see two flags on the beam. In every, I think that in every reformed, conservative, and modern Orthodox shul I visited, uh, Hared is a different thing. There are no flags at all there. Um, I saw two flags. Now you can say it's a small thing, what the significance it has. That means it means a lot. It means a lot and it is anything but obvious. Uh, the fact that uh, the, the, the Israeli flag is in, on the beam, that means a, a huge attachment. That symbolizes a huge attachment. I see, by the way, also non-Jewish, non or events organized by non-Jews uh, that are intended for the Jewish community, in which they also, the, the, the non-Jews, the Gentiles, put the Israeli flag because they understand that's the flag of the Jews. For me, that's very significant. It means a lot. Um, probably in that respect, the most powerful moment I had here was in Pittsburgh. Um, in the Shabbat, following the Shabbat of the shooting, a week later, there was a big Shabbat service in Rodef Shalom Synagogue in Pittsburgh, um, um, in the, which virtually the entire community participated, and it ended with one national anthem. And that anthem was a tikva. For me, and it was, I think it was spontaneous, and I think there were probably 2,000 Jews there. For me, that meant a lot. That symbolizes a lot, symbolized a lot. The, that that we, the, the bond is strong, robust, exists, and it's not going anywhere. Do you go back to Israel uh, changed in any way? And if so, how? Um, more committed. Look, more committed to to the relationship between Israel and American Jews. Um, look, I enter public life as we spoke earlier, uh, basically as a one person, uh, one issue person, and uh, I return in that sense a very different. I return with the strong, with the strongest commitment you can imagine to. To our relationship, the relation between Israel and the American Jews. And I will tell you why. I am not worried about the headline in the Forward or in the Jewish Week or in Yediot Achronot and, and Ma'ariv uh, next week about our relationship. Now, that is a crisis will be, and uh, thing, that, that's not my what bothers. What bothers me and sometimes literally keep me awake at night is not next week's newspaper, but is next century history book. What will the, his, the Jewish history book that will be written 
will be published 100 years from now will say, will say about our, the relationship of our two communities. And my fear, and it's a, a, a very tangible fear, is that it may say, is preventable, but it may say that during the 21st century, the two largest Jewish tribes, Israeli Jews and American Jews split into two unrelated communities. Uh, it may be even worse that one of them disappeared, but uh, uh, let's put it aside for me. And that is for me the most important issue that I, I am sure I will dedicate my coming years in some sense to that. Uh, look, I ask myself frequently, as a question that I didn't ask myself before I came here, I have myself frequently, if in our contemporary Jewish generation, we have an extra mitzvah, and I will explain what I mean. There was a Jewish generation, for instance, that had in Israel and in Eretz Israel and in the America, that had the extra mitzvah to try to save the European Jewry from extermination. Unfortunately, they failed. I'm not judging, probably it was impossible to succeed, but as a matter of fact, they failed. Then there was a Jewish generation that had the extra mitzvah to try to liberate the, the Soviet Jewry, to bring home the Ethiopian Jewry. Thank God they succeeded. What about us? For sure it's not BDS. BDS is, uh, is, is, uh, is nothing comparable to those things. I believe that we have, it's less clear, but I believe that we have two extra mitzvahs. One is to guarantee the existence, but not only the existence, the existence as a robust, secure, thriving state of uh, uh, Medinat Israel. And the second is to guarantee uh, the continuity of Jewish life in all the places that Jews reside. And those two are challenging missions. They are not for granted. And what I believe is, and that I understood, I grasped it here, is the importance of cross-responsibility. Because it's very easy for each one of those two Jewish communities to choose one of those mitzvot only. Israel's will make Israel secure and thriving and robust. Jewish Americans will guarantee the continuity of Jewish lives and the two mitzvot will be fulfilled. No. Every, every Jewish community, every single individual, but every community has to see itself as committed to both of them. Otherwise, we are not one people. And for me, that will be a tragedy if that happens. If each community chooses one and distances itself from the other, that for me will be a tragedy. And we shouldn't allow, allow that to happen. Um, that's part of the uh, mission of the Zionist Rabbinic Coalition, is Which, to try uh, and emphasize that sense That's of the reason your group makes me so optimistic. Because you fulfill those two mitzvot, as the Haredin say, le meadrim. And if I'm not mistaken, you had written this in a column, uh, uh, because I, I quoted it in a sermon, those two Probably. points. Probably. That, that, you, that you refer to, um, because I think they are crucial issues. But Tachlis, uh, what what suggestions are there? How do we try and prevent this fissure and the uh, distancing of our two communities from what you've been able to see? And the I uh, I gave uh, two pieces of advice: one to our new minister of diaspora affairs in Israel, and the second to uh, leaders of the American Jewish community. The advice I gave to the newly upon newly nominated Ministry of, Minister of Diaspora Affairs is to dedicate a significant amount of her budget to educate Israelis about uh, world Jewry. Israelis uh, don't, uh, don't know enough for sure, they probably they don't care enough uh, about their brethren uh, across the ocean. And I would, I think that is uh, a, a, an extremely important task for the government of Israel to, as, so I told them, look, take from your budget a, a significant chunk and spend it in Israel in order to 
raise awareness and uh, and uh, you know the other day I am a, I like a political history and I saw a, 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 a political ad by Tmuat Acherut, the Menachem Begin's party in, back in the 50s. And one of the slogans there was, Hayam ulog vul ameinu. The sea is not the limit of our people. And we have to, to say it again and again and again to Israelis. To the Americans, uh, I gave already one piece of advice, understand Israeli better in order to relate to them better. Uh, uh, understand the, 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 the diverse Israeli society and political system better. But, you know, a lot of people talk with me about uh, reverse uh, birthright. I don't believe in reverse birthright. But uh, my suggestion to those that told me about reverse birthright was reverse APAC. Meaning, uh, I think that American Jewry should open an embassy, an APAC in Israel, permanent with a high profile leader uh, leading it as an ambassador um, to help us uh, and to, um, again, a bi-directional envoy to, um, to make, uh, to advocate for American Jewry in Israel and vice versa for Israeli Jewry in America, uh, educating us, uh, PR and lobby, if the European Union can have a lobbyist in the Knesset, the American Jewry, for sure is entitled to, to do the same. And uh, uh, those are, uh, but you know, the if, uh, bottom line, the, 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 the secret is commitment, to feel that you have a commitment and uh, to educate for that commitment. And, uh, and all the rest is, uh, is implementation. When you, you've mentioned the fact that you uh, had outreach to uh, uh, groups with whom you agree, disagree. Um, some of your priorities uh, uh, being within the liberal and the progressive movement. Can I ask you a question? That is, what do you think is the difference, if there is any, uh, between the way the left in America, and I'm talking about within the Jewish community, approaches uh, Israel and the, the left in Israel? Again, what is the difference between the left in America and the left in Israel? In other words, the American Jewish left or American Jewish progressive movement and the press of uh, uh, those who are on the left in, in Israel politically. You know, uh, it's a difficult question to ask, uh, to, to respond. Uh, <clears throat> you know that uh, the Israeli left is in somewhat in a crisis. Uh, uh, um, but uh, I, will, I will respond to that probably in a different way. I will say this. Um, I fully believe, well, it's not lip service, I believe it from the bottom of my heart that uh, you can be pro-Israel, Zionist, and uh, disagree with virtually all the decisions of the Israeli government. That's okay. Uh, that's perfectly okay. But there are lines that if you cross, you break the solidarity that should exist be between Jews. And I will give you three examples. The first one uh, is the call to dismantle Israel. That was Peter Beinart's uh, 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 offer. Uh, to say, to be virtually what Beinart said to Israel is drop dead. Yeah. And uh, that, that crosses a line, a red line that uh, we cannot, you cannot do that and expect to be considered inside the tent of Jewish solidarity. The second, less obvious, is boycotting Israel or boycotting some Israelis. You can have difference of, differences of opinion. Boycotting Israel or boycotting Israelis, hurting them economically, uh, culturally, or in other way, crosses a line of solid. It's not a political argument. It crosses a line of lack of solidarity. By the way, that exists also in Israel, is that boycott reform Jews, for instance. That also crosses a line of Jewish solidarity. And the third is uh, uh, the calls that I hear uh, quite frequently lately by some Jewish uh, individuals and some Jewish organizations 
to cut or condition security aid to Israel based on political uh, considerations. And to, that is a euphemism to petition American government to give less money to Israel to defend the lives of Jews. Simply as that. If that happens, more Jews will die in Israel. So again, that crosses a line of Jewish solidarity that we cannot allow them to cross without uh, 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 repercussions. I don't think that Israeli left, uh, the mainstream Israeli left, would cross uh, those lines. So the, uh, in the few moments we have remaining, you mentioned about Peter Beinart. Um, any other, uh, did you want to add anything to uh, what you, to refute what uh, he wrote in the New York Times? Well, you know, first of all, uh, the, the thing that I found the most, uh, I mean, hilarious, I would even say, is that he labels that position uh, and that op-ed as progressive. Actually, it's quite regressive. Uh, people that know history, and I'm sure most of you do, a lot of you do, know that that idea that uh, Beinart suddenly had this epiphany uh, was uh, mulled already in the 1920s uh, by Brit Shalom and other organizations, by the way, always by Jewish organizations, not, not, and never by Palestinian organizations. Um, uh, was discarded already in the 30s. And basically the only group that uh, continued to carry on this uh, idea was the Soviet-controlled uh, Communist Party of Palestine, Eretz Israel, that brought it into the 40s, but they also abandoned it later. So it was quite, quite a regressive uh, position uh, uh, that uh, uh, the, 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 the Soviet uh, Communist Party uh, uh, sure. proposed uh, back in the 40s. Uh, also, the, the cherry picking of, uh, of quotes and, 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 and people that he, he quoted there that are blatantly anti-Israeli and anti-Semites, uh, uh, like this Ali Abu Nima, or what his name is, uh, that right. you can find uh, um, uh, terrible quotes of him about uh, about Jews, not only about Israel. So, uh, look, he got his 15 minutes of attention, of glory. I think that what he basically. Halavai, it's only 15 minutes. So, uh, last question uh, in in just a minute we have left, uh, uh, Danny. Um, what will we be hearing uh, uh, from Danny Dayan when he goes back to Israel? Uh, what's your what are your uh, uh, media plans? Or, or I don't know. Uh, the only thing I know for sure that uh, I will stay 14 days in my home quarantining, uh -huh. uh, in, iso in isolation, uh, and uh, later I will see. Uh, I I will stay in the public life. Uh, I will stay in advocating for the things I believe in, uh, in exactly which uh, position or which. Uh, a platform, uh, I don't know for the moment. I think that uh, uh, I always remember that the, the good things in my life, including this position that has been for me really fulfillment of a dream, uh, uh, representing Yerushalayim to New York, uh, uh, happened by surprise, were, un I, I, I were not planned in advance. So we we'll see what the, the future has for me. I uh, am sure I will not be bored. So, uh, uh, Danny, Diane, I want to thank you, first of all, for taking time from a very, very busy week, a very busy schedule to be with us. Uh, but more importantly, thank you for uh, being that voice, going in both directions. Certainly, Ahavad Yisrael, Kla Yisrael, those are values which are central to you and very important, and which uh, 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 we appreciate the fact that you have done so much on behalf of Israel, as well as uh, the American Jewish community, and strengthening those ties. So thank you, and just thank a reminder. You. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I uh, really appreciate uh, the work you do in order to be given uh, uh, closer uh, Israel and uh, the, the American uh, congregations. I saw uh, in the in the participants uh, 
many friends uh, from Cleveland and from other places uh, in which I represent, I had the privilege of representing the state of Israel. And uh, thank you so much for having this event that is extremely significant for me. Thank you. May continue to go. And for this, um, I just want to conclude our conversation by saying, reminding everyone, our next conversation will be with Rabbi uh, Abe Cooper on July 28th at 4 p.m. And the conversation is entitled, What Do You Say to an Anti-Semite? Should be fascinating. For that call, by the way, please do feel free to invite non-rabbis to join us, members of your congregation. Anyone else who would like to participate is invited to do so. Uh, just send them the links. Uh, to be able to sign up, send them to our website. And on Wednesday, August 5th at 1130 is when we'll have our conversation among the rabbis. If you haven't yet joined the Zionist Rabbinic Coalition, please be sure to do so. Um, and we uh, very much uh, appreciate the participation of everyone. Um, until then, uh, uh, all be well. Thank you. Take care.